Glad to see you all. Let's pray before we start. Let's pray. Thank you, dear Lord, our loving and gracious Father in heaven. Thank you for leading us to your word, your word of truth. Thank you for saving us through faith in the gospel. Thank you for guiding us to live as your children in this world. Thank you for helping us to abide in the church, the body of Christ, which is led by your truth, that we can be nourished by your precious word every time and every moment. Help us today in this time to learn your word, your word of truth, that we may handle your word correctly. May your spirit rule over the lips of the speaker and the hearts of all the listeners. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who always loves us. Amen. All right. Today, we are going to study the topic of heresy. Let's open our Bibles to 2 Timothy, chapter 2. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 15. If it's hard to find the verse in your Bible, you can find it on the screen. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 15. Did you find it? Let's read it together. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In this scripture, Apostle Paul is charging Timothy, and it is written, Rightly divide the word of truth. It says, rightly divide the word of truth. Rightly divide means to cut a straight line or to take it straight. An IV version, handle correctly. The word of God is the word of truth. So it's important for us to know it correctly, take it correctly, and believe it correctly. By doing so, we can be approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and consequently, we can offer ourselves to God. The right understanding of the word leads us to the right way of life. On the contrary, wrong understanding of the word results in the wrong way of life. Therefore, the obvious reason to have a right understanding of the word, the necessity of handling accurate the word of truth, is this. First, Correct knowledge of the Word of God gets us to live a life upright, the right understanding of the Word. It guides our life and makes it change. We opened 2 Timothy, and let's turn to chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 15. Verse 15. And that from childhood... You have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So, you can see the benefits the Holy Scriptures give us. The first benefit, it makes you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. We obtain salvation through God's Word, and through His Word, our life is made right. So, here in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, the word of God is necessary not only for the time you were saved, but also for the life afterwards. We can be taught, reproved, corrected, and instructed in righteousness and turn out to be a man of God completely. And truly, we can be thoroughly equipped for every good work. If you want to live your life fully and uprightly, you need to handle the word accurately. When the word works in you, your life will be changed. Apostle Paul, after finishing his second mission trip, well, the third mission trip, on his way back, 
he invited the elders of the Ephesian church to Miletus. They met together at the Miletus, and Paul gave them his farewell sermon. And here is what he says. In Acts chapter 20, verse 32, Paul was saying to them, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and the word of his grace which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The word of His grace will build you up. By the word of God, a Christian is built up. On the contrary, if a man follows wrong words, his life will turn out to be wrong. So it is written in the same chapter, verse 30, Paul said to the Ephesian elders, Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Here it says, Some who speak perverse things will rise up. If anybody follows them, their life will be perverse. That's why we should listen to God's word carefully. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 27 says, Cease listening to instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. There are the false teachings to get us to stray from the words of knowledge. God told us not to listen to those false teachings. I'm saying, when we take hold of God's words with the right understanding, our life will be set straight. Otherwise, it'll be getting ugly. Let's see, First Timothy chapter 6, verse 3, it is written, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine which accords with godliness. We should consent to wholesome words, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine which accords with godliness. We should take it to heart and meditate deeply on it. What if we teach otherwise and take the doctrine in any other way? A serious problem arises. If you read verse 4, verse 4, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corruption minds, corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. If we do not consent to the sound doctrine of our Lord, we'll become proud, ignorant, obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, and will end up with envy, strife, reviling, and evil suspicions. Our minds will be corrupt, destitute of the truth, and will suppose godliness just a means of gain. So, having a sound instruction makes our life sound and wholesome. That's why we've got to hold tight, the sound doctrine. Now, the second reason why we have to handle the word accurately and to abide in the truth is because the correct knowledge about the word keeps us from falling for a, a lie of Satan, the adversary of truth. Jesus said, Satan is a liar. Look at the Gospel of John chapter 8. Jesus rebuked Jewish leaders. You are of your father, the devil. And he said, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Jesus called the devil a liar and the father of it. The devil spreads all kinds of lies, keeping people away from the truth and ruins their souls. Bible says that Satan is a feigner. 2 Corinthians 11.14 says, No wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. He disguises himself as an angel of light and deceives people pretending to give them something good. There's the purpose Satan lies to people, allures them, and deceives them. Firstly, he propagates falsity that people may not get salvation. And secondly, he attacks Christians to fail in their Christian life, that his faith might be ruined and that the gospel couldn't be preached anymore through him. 
not to be deceived by Satan, the liar. We have to be armed with the right understanding of God's word. Satan deceives us in various ways. And concerning the truth, he has two main strategies. Here you can see two main ways Satan deceives a man. Firstly, he lies that the truth is false. He falsifies the truth. And the second way is that he spreads a lie as if it's the truth. These are his two main schemes. There's the truth, but Satan whispers, that's a lie, don't listen to it, don't believe it. He deceives a man saying the truth is false. Also, he sets a trap of falsity and says, this is true. You can get eternal life and go to heaven by believing in it and gets people to fall into false teachings. He fools them to believe in the lie. Then how can we tell Satan's lie? The criteria to tell right from wrong is none other than the Bible. The exact criteria to discern the truth from falsity is the Bible, the word of truth that God has given to us. So whatever you may hear, you can check it whether it fits to the Bible or not. It is written in Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. If you do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. It says that they should speak according to God's word. By checking if it fits to the scriptures, we can tell the right from wrong. Therefore, it's so important for us to have the correct knowledge of the Bible. Knowing the truth protects us and sets us free from Satan's lie. So Jesus said in John chapter 8 verse 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. When we know the truth accurately, we can be free from all kinds of false teachings. So today, uh, we are going to study the topic of heresy, which will be categorized into two main parts. Firstly, we are going to think about Satan's scheme to turning truth into lies. And secondly, turning lies into truth. Now, there is Satan's lie, the scheme or deceit, to turn truth into lies. Where did it start? It started from treating even Jesus Christ as a lie and a heretic. Here I brought some scriptures about it. Jesus, he is the truth itself, isn't he? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He's true and the truth itself. But it was Satan who treated him as a cult. Satan worked in the hearts of religious leaders in Judea and got them to regard Jesus as a cult, a heresy. In Matthew eleven nineteen, they indicated Jesus and said, Look, a glutton and a wine biber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, they said, He's out of his mind. He has Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. They treated Jesus as a cult, calling him demon-possessed. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, they accused him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. They called him a Samaritan or even demon-possessed. Satan has been strongly deceiving people with all slanders that Jesus was a cult, who in effect was the truth itself. And that Satan didn't stop there, but went further to revile the Apostle Paul for a ringleader as a cult, who, by the way, was used as a great worker of Christ in all the process of preaching the gospel. Concerning Apostle Paul, if you read Acts chapter 24, you'll find the religious leaders accusing Paul before Felix, the governor. They were accompanied by a certain orator named Tertullus and accused Paul, saying, We have found this man a plague. Plague means pestilence here. This man is like a pestilence, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Tertullus reviled Paul. 
Yes, even Paul was treated as a heretic. He was called the ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Acts 28 shows us Paul going to Rome as a prisoner on the trial. At the time, Jewish Romans came to him. They wanted to hear what it was that Paul was preaching. They used this expression as they were saying, chapter 28, verse 22, We desire to hear from you what you think. For concerning this sect, we know that it is spoken against everywhere. So the Jews in Rome at that time came out to Paul saying, What on earth is that you are talking about? What makes you and your sect be rejected everywhere? Let's hear it. At that time, the gospel was regarded as a heresy. Not only that time, but also in 2,000 years of history in Christianity, Christians who preached the gospel were treated as a heresy constantly. They gave them all kinds of malicious calling. There is um, Anabaptists who said that infant baptism doesn't have much of a meaning, but the biblical baptism is the one that a born-again Christian receives as a confession of his faith after he got saved by believing in the gospel. That is, the, that is accurate. But then they were attacked by others being called Anabaptists and treated as a heresy. They ignored the tradition. They made up a new one. People persecuted, persecuted them and treated them as a heresy, even though they were true Christians. There's another calling people gave, Protestant. These are the group of people who are against the corrupted Catholic Church and its secular authority. They were split from the Catholic Church to preach the most biblical and genuine gospel. And yet they were also attacked, being called Protestant. Protesters, resistors, defiers of beautiful tradition. There is also Moravian Church. These were the very precious group of Christians who preached the gospel, along with Zinzendorf, the great worker of the gospel. Through them, John Wesley was saved. But people named them Moravians and implanted an image through the name that they were a, a heretic heretical church, a very minor group that fabricated their own doctrine or something. And people twisted the truth with all lies. Even until today, Satan's work continues. At present, Satan spreads lies among people that even our church as well is a heresy. Deceived by him, many people still have a misunderstanding of us. We came here in this church, listened to the gospel, got saved, and have been leading our Christian life to the full. But people around us say, Oh, that guy is attending a heretical church. You shouldn't go to his church. You should avoid him if he invites you. Regarding us as heresy, they stay away from us. We experience it from time to time. Satan's scheme to twist the truth into falsity is constantly coming up even now. When we are asked the reason why our church is heresy, they give various reasons. So, today we need to check them out one by one based on the Bible. What does the Bible tell us? The things extrinsic to the Bible could be ambiguous to judge. But we can still and need to judge when it comes to the Bible what the Bible tells us, and what the criteria Bible shows us. Jesus said, It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. This world persecuted Jesus, mocked him, and called him a heresy. Likewise, the same thing can happen to the true disciples of Jesus. So, we don't need to be aggrieved by their misunderstanding. It's being done as it is written in the Bible. All we have to do is to handle accurately the word of truth, being ready to give an answer to them and delivering the word of truth. Now, let's check out several reasons why they accuse us of heresy. 
Here's the first reason. They say, our church overemphasizes the salvation of the Spirit. Sometimes it happens when our brothers and sisters preach the gospel, they ask this question out of curiosity. Were you saved? Were you born again? Even though the person attends a church already. Do you have an assurance of salvation to go to heaven if you stand before God right now? Because the salvation of the Spirit is so much important, we ask the question. We are not curious about how many years he has attended church, what position or duty he has, or how zealous he has been. We don't care. We care whether or not his spirit was saved, whether he has become a child of God to inherit his kingdom. That's what matters to us. So we ask that part to them, even though they attend church. But to those who are not saved, these questions are found quite uncomfortable. So they say, people in this church overemphasize the salvation of the spirit, confusing those who are just fine. They make people confused of their salvation and take them, take them away from our church. They accuse us like this. Well, we are emphasizing salvation of the Spirit. Sure, we have to. There are the messages this world wants to hear from the church. There are the messages this world wants. In the time of the Old Testament as well, people said the same thing to the prophets. It is written in Isaiah chapter 30 verse 10. They say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things. Speak to us smooth things, prophesy deceits. They demand soothing words. The Bible is clearly warning us of our sins and corruption, the judgment and the damnation of hell. And it explicitly shows us the way to salvation, that how we can escape from the judgment and damnation. What the entire scriptures is emphasizing the most is the salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ. However, as we are preaching the message of salvation, we cannot help but speak of sins and judgment and the damnation of hellfire because we have to let them know their spiritual state. But they don't want to hear it. This world wants to hear from the church something soothing, how to get prosperous, how to win, how to get an honor. They want to hear from us some, some message hopeful. Sure, God gives us a hopeful message, but before that, he puts stress on this message of knowing our spiritual state in the first place and escaping from the fate of going to hellfire. People are not pleased with these messages like sins, judgment, or hell. So churches nowadays in this world do not say it much. But our church, just as the Bible puts stress on, preaches the message of salvation most emphatically. There are things the Bible emphasizes. It emphasizes the redemption of a soul through Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, it shows us the antitype of Christ, and the New Testament also centers on Jesus Christ. So John chapter 5, verse 39 says, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. Bible is what testifies of Jesus Christ. And... What we should obtain through the Bible is eternal life. Bible clearly says that. And Jesus also mentioned that the issue of salvation or being born again is the most important matter. So in John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, a Pharisee and a ruler of the Jews, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, which means he had a great zeal to God. But Jesus emphatically said with this expression, most, ass most assuredly, I say to you, you cannot say the kingdom of God unless you are born again. It doesn't matter he was attending church. It doesn't matter he had religious passion. More than that, his spirit being born again, his spirit being saved. 
That is what matters most in the view of the Bible. Since Jesus put stress on the salvation of the Spirit the most, church also should stress on it the most. We shouldn't evasively skip over the matter of salvation. We need to examine ourselves as to whether we were truly born again, whether we were truly saved. We cannot emphasize enough when it comes to the salvation of our spirit. Now, there's a second misunderstanding of our church. People get us wrong, saying their teaching is like the date of being born again is the condition of being born again. They don't approve one's salvation if he doesn't know the date on which he was born again. Well, there's something we need to think about. When we evangelize someone, we ask him, were you saved? Were you born again? And when he says yes, we ask him again, when were you born again and how? Then he asks back, do we have to have the date when we were born again? They find it strange to have the date. But apparently there is the date. Because salvation is obtained not gradually over time, but at once by faith. There is the moment a person believes in the gospel. You see, in the Bible it says, salvation is obtained at once by faith. Colossians chapter 1 verse 6. Colossians chapter 1 verse 6 says, It is written, Which has come to you, as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard it and knew the grace of God in truth. Word of the gospel has come to us. We heard the gospel. Faith comes by hearing. So as we heard it, the grace of God was made known to us. There's the day faith came to us by hearing the gospel. Surely there is the moment a person got saved. It's because it's done by faith. It's because it's done at once, instantly. Jude 1.3 Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Here again it says, the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints, as Paul mentions concerning our common salvation. Since salvation is obtained by faith once for all, there must be the moment a man is saved by faith. So there's the day a man got saved. I mean, the date he was born again. Many of the fathers of faith before us testified of the day they were born again. You know, Martin Luther, who initiated the revolution, uh, reformation, though he was ordained as a priest in 1507, he testified that he was born again in 1513 through the scriptures of Romans. Pascal, a mathematician and physicist, was a Christian, and he also testified that he was born again on the 23rd of November, 1654. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, confessed that he was born again on the 24th of May, 1738, which was 10 years after he became a minister. He even mentioned the time he believed it was 8.45 p.m. as he was listening to the word of God. He received the word by faith and was born again. Charles Finney testified that he was born again on the 11th October, 1821. Charles Spurgeon also gives testimony of his faith that he was born again on the 6th of January, 1850. Being born again means the rebirth of our spirit. Just as our body was born, there's the day our spirit was born again. Like you have your birthday, a born-again Christian has the birthday of his spirit. A truly saved Christian knows when, where, and how he was born again. Some may think they don't know whether they are saved or not, whether they go to heaven or not, and they think it It'll all be decided after they die. Well, it's not. Truth is, it is decided while we are living on the earth. As we are listening to the word of truth, which is the gospel, and by faith we have a much assurance that we are to go to heaven, there is the day 
the first Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 5 says, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. See, when we were saved through the gospel, there was the work of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, and we have much assurance. 2 Corinthians 13.5 as well says, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Indeed, unless you are, unless indeed you are disqualified. It tells us to examine ourselves and test ourselves. Unless Christ is in you, you are disqualified. And the saved people can know it for themselves. Do you not know yourselves? Here's the point. You know it yourself. The saved know that they were saved. They know when and how they were saved. Of course, the exact date when he was saved could be confusing. In case he listened to the Bible seminar many times and had an assurance of salvation through the time, he may get the date mixed up. Knowing the exact date is not important, but having the day of salvation is. The day of salvation in this context means the day you obtain salvation by faith through the gospel. Not a gradual process of achieving salvation, but an instant experience of believing the gospel. The day you, your faith came to you by hearing it surely exists. Some people may not know the exact date of their birth for many reasons, but still they have the day they were born, for sure. Likewise, those who are saved of their souls may not specify the exact date. It's okay. You can forget the date. It's all right. What matters most is that you have an assurance of salvation through the word of truth, the gospel, and the assurance is formed at a certain moment when the faith comes to you by hearing the gospel. There is the day. It's no problem you don't know the date. You can forget it. And yet, there is the day because salvation is obtained at once by faith. The Bible explicitly tells us that there is a day. Now, the third misunderstanding about our church is this. People say that we teach something different, something unique, like we get salvation by some kind of understanding or knowledge. People think that we emphasize some special content called understanding, and they maliciously make up a word to mislead others. However, the word we call understanding is the term also used in the Bible. The Bible used the word understanding when someone clearly knows and believes. This term understanding is used just as a meaning of clearly knowing and believing the gospel, not any other special or spiritual term. It's the same meaning as believing. In Matthew 13, 23, Jesus also used this expression in the parable of the, of the sower, but he who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Jesus also said, he who hears the word and understands it, it is an expression of hearing the word, knowing it clearly and believing it. And we are using the same term. In Luke 24, 45, it is also written, and he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. It is written that Jesus Christ, who was raised up from the dead, opened the disciples' understanding and let them believe it. Colossians chapter 1, verse 6. It's the verse we already referred to. Which has come to you, as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you, since the day you heard it, you the grace of God in truth. Yes. It is to know the grace. It is to believe it. Here, Colossians chapter 2, verse 2 again, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. Here again, the knowledge of the mystery of God, says the Bible. It's not some special doctrine of our own church, but a simple meaning of clearly knowing and believing, as the Bible says. Not just getting the knowledge and have a intellectual consent, but truly receiving the gospel to our heart as our own and having faith in it. That is expressed as the understanding. We didn't diverge from the Bible. We use the term understanding as it is written in the Bible. 
Now, the fourth misunderstanding is this. They accuse us that we are teaching like this. Salvation is once for all, so we are free to live whatever we want to live. And they revile us as an abolitionist of the law because we preach that salvation is once for all. It is eternal redemption. Salvation is secure. They say, well, then, do you mean that we can freely commit any kind of sins? They mislead people as if we are teaching self-indulgence. However, we need to check out what the Bible tells us. As you know, the Bible assures us that salvation is eternal. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12 Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. It says eternal redemption. It is also written, God will not remember our sins. Those who receive the grace of Jesus on the cross in their heart, those who truly believe the gospel, the saved people, have everlasting life and will not be lost forever. John 10, 28 And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. By the eternal life our Lord gave to us, We shall never perish, and no one can snatch us out of our Father's hand. So, it's accurate that salvation is eternal and secure. The Bible clearly says to us that our salvation is eternal. But don't get me wrong, we are not teaching we can freely commit sins abusing these scriptures. Surely salvation is eternal, but there follows the life worthy of a Christian after salvation. The Bible definitely teaches us holy life, and our church teaches it too. Justification. Those who are justified are to go through the process of sanctification, which is to live a holy and godly life. When we were born again, we became children of God. Of course, we might make a mistake or stumble or commit sin from time to time after we were saved. And yet, it doesn't make our soul be lost again to be condemned to hellfire. You need to think about it. Is it okay for us to live a sinful and corrupted life now that we are under the grace and not under the law? The Bible says no. And our church never teaches that. It is written in Romans chapter 6, verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. It is a definite truth that we are under the grace. We are not under the law but under the grace as children of God. This is a crystal clear fact the scripture tells us. But it doesn't mean that we are okay to live on our own, committing sins freely, though we are under the grace, and our Father forgives no matter what wrong we may do. Shall we sin, against, uh, shall we sin because we are not on the law but under grace? Certainly not. That's the voice from our conscience. Certainly not. A Christian who truly understood the grace, who obtained eternal redemption, who truly received the grace of God, cannot abuse the grace of Jesus on the cross for their sinful desire. Rather, their conscience becomes brighter. When they are tempted, they think of Jesus. Oh, my Lord, Jesus was crucified because of this sin. How can I sin anymore? Certainly not. They can get the strength to overcome the temptation. If we teach that we could live a sinful life on your own because you are secure of your salvation, the life of all the congregation might have been ruined. But we don't teach that, and our brothers and sisters do not live so. Rather, their life is getting more and more sanctified. They are living worthy of a Christian. So all these accusations are misunderstanding and false accusation. And behind their back is laid the deceit of Satan. You've got to know this. Now, the, the fifth misunderstanding about our church is that people say that we teach eschatology, terminal Apocalypse. They say we stress on the impending second coming of Jesus and his judgment and scare people. They say we insist on apocalypse. 
Well, you need to think about what the Bible tells us. Apparently, in the end time, there will be Jesus' second coming, the rapture of saints, and the judgment of fire of God's wrath on this world that rejected His grace to the end. It is all written in the Bible. Apparently, there is Jesus' second coming and the judgment. We don't know the exact date or the time. God didn't make it known to anybody, but He made known to us one thing, which is the signs of the last days. If you read Matthew chapter 24, it is written, Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus' disciples asked him the signs of the Lord's coming and of the end of the age. The following verses will be familiar to you. Jesus listed up all the signs of the last days. And verse 36 in the same chapter, Matthew 24, Jesus said, But of that day and an, an hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. From this verse, we can know that Jesus clearly mentioned the signs of his second coming, but not the exact date and time. So, if there's anybody or any sect that appoints any certain day and insists that the day is the day of Jesus' second coming and the day of judgment, that is against the Bible. That is a false teaching. However, teaching that there is the end time and the judgment and teaching the signs of the last days is absolutely biblical. As Jesus taught, as the Bible stressed on, the church has a responsibility to blow the warning horns about the signs of the last days, the second coming, and the judgment. If any church does not give a warning to people, though the impending wrath is coming. If they just soothe people by saying peace and safety, that'll be the false teaching against the Bible. We do not set a date and insist on the apocalypse of that particular day. But the last day is surely coming, according to the Bible. And we are teaching the signs as it is written in the Bible. We are doing according to the Bible. And the sixth misunderstanding about our church. They mislead people by saying we deny the exist existing churches. We ignore the beautiful and conventional service rituals of Korea and adhere to our own unique service style. And that is why we are heresy. That's what they are talking about. Well, this is so sad. Point being, nobody can say it's heresy by reason of not following their service style. And there's a clear reason we have a different service style. We need to check it out clearly. For example, most of the churches recite Lord's Prayer. They recite it all together during the Sunday service. Lord's Prayer is the prayer Jesus taught his disciples directly. The disciples asked him to teach them how to pray. Pray in this manner, said Jesus, and taught them all about prayer. And that is written in Matthew chapter 6. But most of the churches recite this Lord's Prayer during Sunday service, and that's great. But we don't recite it in the service. We only pray according to what Jesus intended to give us his prayer. We pray with the contents and subjects he taught us. With the same contents and subjects, we pray our prayer. Of course, I'm not saying it's wrong to memorize the Lord's Prayer, ponder the meaning, and recite it. We don't say it's wrong. But it shouldn't be criticized that we don't recite it in the service. It's because Lord's Prayer appears in Matthew chapter 6 and also Luke chapter 11 as well. 
and there are slight differences in phrases and expressions, though the contents and subjects are the same. If Jesus wanted us to memorize and recite it in the first place, Lord's Prayer in Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel will be exactly the same without a single word. And yet, most of the churches recite Lord's Prayer in Matthew's Gospel, but not in Luke's. And they, accusing, uh, they are accusing us of not reciting the Lord's Prayer in Matthew's Gospel. They denounce us, saying, You are not following the worship style. That's a disregard of the Lord's Prayer. You disregard and deny the tradition of the existing churches. Well, they shouldn't do that. The prayer of our Lord, uh, he, he taught us, is a teaching of how to pray and what to pray, rather than just memorizing and repeating it. Concerning prayer, Jesus even said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. See, Matthew chapter 6, verse 7 says, Do not use vain repetitions. Vain repetition means repeating the same thing and say it over again. So, when Jesus taught his disciples, he already said not to pray like chanting a spell. I don't mean that memorizing it is not good. But I'm saying that we are doing fine as Jesus intended when he taught us. We learn his prayer and we pray with what Jesus prayed. One more thing is the Apostles' Creed. They recite it too, and we don't, during the time of Sunday service. And this leads them to accuse us again that we reject the Apostles' Creed and don't believe in it. Well, it's not. The Apostles' Creed is not even the Bible. Lord's Prayer is clearly on the Bible. It's what Jesus said. The Apostles' Creed, on the other hand, is not. And those apostles who made the creed were not even those apostles Jesus appointed. It was made up in the first church council of Nicaea in 325 AD, and the process of preaching the gospel, false teachings came in. So they needed to resolve the controversy and set the truth of the gospel straight. So it was made in 325 AD. It is not the Bible, nor was it written by the apostles. However, it is well describing the contents and the core of the gospel which we believe in. The contents are well organized here that God is the creator. He sent Jesus Christ to the world through Mary. Jesus died for us and rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven. The Holy Spirit came, the, the communion of saints, Jesus coming again, the resurrection of our body, all the core messages of the gospel we believe in is fairly summed up. But we are not reciting it together officially in our Sunday service because it's not the Bible, nor is what the apostles wrote. Furthermore, there are some errors mixed up that are not quite correct, though the core messages basically fit to biblical teaching. Though we learned and knew and believed all those core messages, yet there are slight errors in the Apostles' Creed, and that's why we do not recite it all together. For example, here's the thing. If you see the Apostles' Creed, it starts with, uh, in Korean version translation, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Actually, the expression of creator is more correct. There is a difference between maker and creator. Originally, it used the word maker, but then it was changed to creator recently. The Apostles' Creed is not the Bible, so it is amended or altered. It was amended again now, so the expression maker is not quite correct. And there's another expression. Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary. And... Oh... Uh, when it says Virgin Mary, it means he was born from a virgin. 
and the V in the Virgin was written in the capital letter. The first letter of a name is capitalized, but the V and the meaning of a Virgin doesn't need to be capitalized. So this capital letter V Virgin has their standpoint of deifying Mary. Mary is surely the one we should respect and emulate, but she is not a deity. But in this creed, they kind of idolize Mary. Also, there's this expression suffered under Pontius Pilate. Well, truth be told, he suffered under the Jewish religionists. And then there's another expression which was not translated in the Korean version. Here it says, crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. In the English version, it says, he descended into hell. English translation clearly stated, Jesus died, buried, descended into hell, and rose again. And because it could cause a problem, this phrase was omitted from the Korean translation. So the Apostles' Creed could be amended and could have some errors. That's why we don't recite it in an official place. And there's this word, the Holy Catholic Church. It was made in the Catholic background. So we don't bother to memorize it. However, not memorizing it doesn't mean that we deny the fundamental content. But people accuse us of being heresy because of the reason we don't follow their rituals. One of the peculiar things in Korean churches is the dawn prayer. We don't do it all together. Apparently, in the Bible, there are, some, uh, there are many sins of people getting up early in the morning and praying at dawn. David prayed at dawn, and so did our Lord Jesus. So many churches have this time together. With a yearning heart, they get up at dawn, rubbing their eyes and gathering together, sing praises, and learn God's word and pray. But we don't have time for official dawn prayer at the church. I'm not saying that dawn prayer is not good, of course, and there are many of us who are praying at dawn personally. There are many of us who have a personal meditation time with God early in the morning. Not having an official time of the dawn prayer never means that we disregard it. Our Lord Jesus Christ also prayed at dawn. But see how he prayed. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, Now in the morning, Having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Jesus prayed before daylight, and he was in a solitary place. He had a personal time with God and not the official service of the dumb prayer. Biblical dumb prayer is rather going into a quiet personal room, shutting the door, and praying to the Father who is in the secret place, who sees in secret. Matthew chapter 6 verse 6. I'm not saying it's wrong to pray a gathering all together, but it is also wrong to accuse us as heresy because of the reason we don't follow the conventional way of worship, doing it all together. It's not because we deny the conventional way of worship of any other churches, but because we learn the Bible and do it with the heart of finding more biblical way. Now, here comes the biggest incident that made us look like a heresy. People say, life or admission belongs to the cult of salvation. That is the church brought about public censure. In fact, there was a church named Evangelical Baptist Church, which caused a great noise to this country. Through the incidents of the Odeon Corporation in 1987 and the case of the Seoul Ferry in 2014, they were revealed to the world and people made a social issue of it, calling them a cult of salvation. Obviously, they had a problem. But if you search of it, Evangelical Baptist Church preached the gospel purely at first. But then they misused the offerings of the church to their own business fund. And as they were embezzling the money, they were misled and degenerated gradually. As a result, they were away from the word of God, revealed their corruption and caused many problems in our society. It's true that that church was criticized. While they were preaching the gospel purely, we were with them. 
However, we were separated from them from 1983, and since then, we, Life Word Mission, has been keeping and preaching the pure gospel only without any contact or connection with them. Never have any social problem ever been caused by our church. And yet, whenever they cause any problems, we were denounced together with them. If you search the history of our church correctly, you'll find out that our church has nothing to do with that group that caused social issues or any of their false teaching or wrong doctrine. Our church never made any social issues, but purely preached the gospel. We are at the forefront of preaching the gospel all over the country and the world. Sometimes people judge us and denounce us, no matter what, without hearing what we say because of all of these misunderstandings. Well, Satan is doing the same thing from the time of Jesus Christ. But if we check it out according to the Bible, if we prepare to give an answer to those who have a misunderstanding and deliver them the truth, those misunderstandings will be resolved. It has been resolved a lot, actually, and it will be all cleared up as we are preaching the word of truth and living a life worthy of the gospel. So, we have been checking out the part of Satan's scheme of falsifying the truth. Now, there is the other scheme of Satan, which is spreading lies as if it's the truth. Well, time's almost up, so we cannot handle this part in detail today. But this part was handled many times in the other previous sermons about heresy. So you can refer to the material I handed out today. It'll be a help. Satan fabricates a falsehood and deceit people that it's a truth. That's how they make up um, a heresy. The term heresy is the Chinese uh, in the Chinese language composed of the word different plus the end, which means its end is different. In ancient Greek, it is heresies, which means their own chosen opinion. Though they are in Christi Christianity, Christianity clothing, but their end is something totally different. What they know, what they believe in, what they insist on is totally different. There are certain schemes of making up those heresies a lot, deceiving people that it's true. Jesus said in Matthew, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. They are in Christianity's clothing, but their inside is a wolf. When you discern the truth from the falsehood, you can get away from the deceit. I want to share with you um, the seven traits of heresy based on the Bible. And it would have been a great help, but because we don't have enough time, uh, you, you just need to refer to the handout. Because you've heard a lot from all the other sermons, you might be able to tell we are preaching only the Bible. So if you encounter a um, heretic, protect yourself first that your spirit may not be contaminated by the false teaching. If you hear them and receive them, your spirit will be defiled. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We should cleanse ourselves from all filthiness, not only of the flesh, but also of the spirit, Bible also mentioned that reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. It is not healthy to have a curiosity over false teachings and peep at them. And the second attitude to deal with heresy is to hold fast the word of truth. Holding fast the word of truth protects us from false teaching. Hebrews 3.14 says, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So hold it steadfast to the end. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 says, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of. When we continue in the truth, we can be protected from the false accusations about our church and from the false teachings circulating in this world. 
rightly dividing the word of truth and keeping it, that is the point I wanted to share today. So today we had time to learn about heresy. Let's all pray. Our loving and gracious Father, we thank you. Thank you for your grace to give us the Bible, your word of truth, that we may be protected from false teachings and that we may live a life in truth. Help us to hold fast the truth you give to us through the Bible, that we may be protected from falsehood and that we may keep ourselves from the misunderstandings, and that we may prepare for the answers and deliver the word of truth properly. We prayed in the name of Jesus Christ, who always loves us. Amen. Thank you very much.